business? Is it is introductions? Uh, I'm Zan Ogereau, uh, the board chair for the year. Nancy Wise, commissioner. Uh, Pat Malone, commissioner. Vance Crony, county council. Rachel McEnany, county administrator. Corey Grogan, public information. Amanda Makepeace, Benton County staff. Laura Kwiatkowski, Benton County staff. James Morales, records and elections director. Rick Craiger, chief financial officer. And you're in the health department, director. We already saw the sheriff, so Sheriff Benar still is online also. And I think that about covers us for the moment. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the fact that uh, everyone is working from home. Most people are working from home today and uh, that the weather is really um, dicey. Uh, um, the roads are in very tough shape, icy. So thank you all for being so flexible. We will now move on to the regular agenda. Are there any additions to the agenda other than um, a conversation after our formal business about the weather? Hearing none, I'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, we'll move on to comments from the public. Are there any members of the public that would like to make public comment at this time? Hearing none, uh, we will move on to our work session. I am getting a little bit of feedback, so I'm wondering whether someone does have their mic on. Uh, yep, thank you. Um, and the first item of business is our monthly public health update with April Holland. Good morning, commissioners, Rachel, everyone here today. Um, I, I did get some of the latest data up on some slides, and, and I'm not sure if um, staff here have that available. If not, I'd be happy to share my slides um, to give you, ah, thank you so much, and the magic happens. Um, uh, and I'm here to give you an update on what's going on out there in terms of um, COVID-19 and other respiratory illnesses. And I'm happy, of course, to engage in the discussion uh, around um, weather conditions as, as they pertain to the health department um, as, when we get to that. So this first slide, um, as you know, is uh, COVID hospitalizations over time. Um, as of January 9th, there were 242 individuals hospitalized um, across the state. Um, and uh, as you may, uh, as you've likely gathered uh, across the US and here in Benton County, we're in the midst of a, a COVID-19 surge. This one is driven by an Omicron subvariant called JN1. Um, and it is uh, estimated to account for approximately 60% of circulating variants um, in our area right now. So JN1 is just somewhat distantly related to the XBB 1.5 variant um, upon uh, which the latest COVID uh, booster was formulated. Um, and this variant is causing a big rise in cases and rises in hospitalizations, but extensive population immunity, um, it, it attenuates or, or makes less impactful the virulence or severity of of this um, and and any of the dominating variants at this uh, at this time and in this time space and time that we're in with a lot of um, population immunity, um, higher levels of widespread vaccination would help this effect even more. So we continue to see a dominating variant that has more uh, immune evasion, more people get sick, and therefore. Uh, some are, are hospitalized and have severe disease. So um, our COVID testing positivity, you can, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for the next slide there. Um, it all kind of mixes together for, for a couple of minutes here. Um, the COVID testing positivity is um, it's right around 11%. You can see here our, our uh, 
wastewater monitoring um, data here, a lot more color than we have seen uh, recently. Um, just one more note on hospitalizations. You know, these um, looking at the wastewater data, which which is a helpful tool to help us see sort of where we are and what may be to come in the next couple of weeks, seeing so much activity here. Um, leads us to to suggest that hospitalizations will continue to be elevated for um uh, through through the month of January so another couple of weeks um so um you know uh, the the data all aligns right now um as as we all know we're not counting individual cases but we look to um things like emergency visits hospitalizations wastewater data um, and outbreak information to see uh, where we are. And you can see um, at the, the bottom of this wastewater map that almost all of the sampling detected some signal of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater um, with a, a, a good many um, uh, experiencing increase or sustained increases. So um, hospitalization rates, if we're looking at, at CDC data, um, I'll move on to, to flu in just one sec, but hospitalization rates for COVID-19 right now um, are, are um, for Oregon are about 3.7 per 100,000 for all ages. Um, it's not as high as we have seen them thanks to uh, to that population immunity, but we do need to continue to be mindful and protective of um, of folks 65 and older, the hospitalization rate is much higher. So I said 3.7 per 100,000 for the general population, and it's 12.6 per 100,000 for uh, folks ages um, 65 and up, according to the most recent data. So moving on to the, the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, wastewater data for flu. We are... Um, we are in flu season as well. Um, you can see that, you know, um, about 70% of all of the uh, wastewater sample sites um, detected some amount of influenza in the wastewater. Um, about 40% uh, um, are experiencing increase or sustained increase. Um, and uh, flu in, in, in the state, we are also expecting another couple of weeks of rising before we hit that plateau. Um, the testing positivity rate is, uh, for the last date is actually identical to COVID-19. So about 11% of all tests are positive at this time. Next slide, please. So here's the wastewater data for RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. Um, RSV is, is holding steady in the state, um, well, about half, as you see on this map, uh, of the wastewater sites detected some uh, measurable RSV signals. Um, and um, we are hoping to peak for the season and see a de decrease really soon. Um, RSV, as I've mentioned previously, is as um, a big driver of hospitalizations in the very young and, and our elderly population. Um, hospitalization rates um, for RSV are, are, are low overall for the whole population, just at, at 2.4 per 100,000 people. But when we look at, at zero to four-year-olds, um, it's 23 per 100,000 among that, uh, that group. Um, and, uh, and, 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 4.4 for age 65 and older. So I'm hoping to see that decrease soon. Next slide, please. This next slide looks at weekly emergency department visits by the, the illness type. The black line is, is the, the three um, main uh, players combined. And then you can see it broken out and um, relative to where we were say in, in November. Um, to the end of the year and into January, you can see that we've experienced, um, we're experiencing the season right now. Um, and uh, just under 6% of, of uh, ED visits uh, at the most recent data um, collection um, were for these, these respiratory illnesses. 
Next slide, please. So you've seen this slide before. Just want to remind all of us in, in our communities that the uh, updated fall 2023 COVID vaccine um, is protective. It does um, provide protection from severe illness. Um, you see the recommendations in front of you. And for the last few meetings, I've been bringing you uh, vaccine uh, administration numbers. I don't have those most recent numbers for you today, but um, according to um, Oregon Health Authority data, um, Benton County, along with Hood River, um, both have the, the highest um, vaccination rates uh, among counties uh, for the state um, with 18% uh, of, of all populations um, up to date with the fall 2023 vaccine. Um, again, more uptake would be better for us in the long run. So uh, we really uh, encourage folks to ask questions, learn more if they haven't received this vaccine to um, to uh, to get to 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 a place where they're they're ready to get it. We're here to answer your questions, and um, the vaccine is available um, both um, in health services and across our community. Next slide, please. Just a quick update. Um, we've talked about RSV vaccination previously. Um, there have been some um, supply issues with uh, Nersevimab, which is the, the RSV vaccine for, for little babies. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to share that additional doses of this vaccine have been put into circulation. Um, and so uh, all, all administration is back to uh, standard ways of, of administering this vaccine. So it's available um, and um, providers are recommending it um, to uh, the populations listed here. Um, I think there's just a couple more slides here. Next, um, we all know about the, our annual flu vaccine. It's not too late to get a flu vaccine if you haven't received one yet. They are also widely available, um, often for low or no cost. Um, and flu is out there and it's not been fun for folks. Um, it does have an impact on our system. So um, again, uh, it's the best day if you haven't had a flu vaccine this season, the best way day to get one is, well, maybe not today with the roads, but hopefully in, in the next couple of days here. Um, next and, and final slide, um, here we are in January. Uh, let's have a, a healthy start to the new year. Um, ensure we're up to date with, with those vaccines, um, staying home when, when we're sick, and, and especially when it comes to COVID-19, but also other, other illnesses, you know, uh, utilizing those resources that are available to us is important. Um, home tests are still effective, um, uh, and the, and those home antigen tests work for COVID-19. Um, if, if someone does test uh, positive, uh, it's, uh, it's a good idea to check in with your provider to see if the available therapeutics um, are, are, are right for you. They have made a, a difference for a lot of folks. Um, so the only, only other little uh, piece of news on, on the public health front in terms of, of illness is I uh, just wanted to alert you to the fact that there is um, there are some measles cases in Southwest Washington right now. Um, uh, our, our friends in uh, Clark County and around uh, are, are not strangers to this kind of outbreak, unfortunately, but currently um, the case count is at six and um, it, uh, it, it may or may not increase, but our CD team is at the ready to assist and, um, and learn of any possible exposures in our area. So that's all I have on the, on the public health front. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. April, um, given the snow and ice uh, and the fact that we have been doing emergency sheltering, uh, do you have a brief update for the board about uh, how the um, emergency cold weather sheltering is going? You are muted, April. Yeah.
Thank you so much uh, for alerting me to that. Um, I didn't want to go out of turn or spoil anyone else's um, news here. So yeah, I do. I'd, I'd be happy to share this with you. Um, as you all know, uh, commissioners, the health department holds a contract for overflow, severe weather sheltering um, with a contractor, uh, Faith, Hope and Charity. Uh, they did activate their operations on Friday and our uh, we'll work through tonight uh, for the uh, hopefully final night of activation for this um, for this event. They use a mix of hotel and congregate sheltering um, in severe weather for people who, for whatever reason, um, can't access um, other sheltering. Um, all in all, night to night, the the number of people served um, uh, varied some, but uh, more than 20 hotel rooms were used, and the congregate site, First Christian Church, was at full capacity um, each night except Friday night when it was close. Um, due to the unanticipated closure of many of our daytime warming sites, our, our partners, our community partners, and, and some of our staff stepped up to, to volunteer um, to ensure that um, that uh, daytime warming could, uh, could be accommodated. Um, I want to just give a special thanks to Allison Hopgood and the, the folks at Corvallis Daytime Drop-In Center who helped ensure that um, daytime warming could be staffed on site at First Christian Church. Um, I wanna thank Unity Shelter for being able to um, increase their, um, their operating hours so that guests could, um, could stay in, in place and stay warm. Um, and wanna thank our staff from our um, health department, um, harm reduction and healthy communities team who, who stepped up to, to volunteer as well. I also just want to express thanks for emergency management. Um, Brian and I were in frequent contract contact throughout uh, the days and, and nights um, to ensure that important updates were passed along. I really appreciate how communicative and, and accessible um, our, our interchanges um, are. Um, and I know he must have been getting messages left and right from so many folks. So um, it's it's wonderful to have such a, a good working relationship with emergency management. Um, I know there are probably more questions that you have, but I just uh, that's that's the overview. Thank you. I'm very grateful. Are there questions? Okay. Yeah, uh, April, you mentioned vaccination rate and Benton County is once again <clears throat> at the top of the um, list of counties for rates. 18% uh, seems um, like, well, we're, we're number one, but uh, uh, overall, we're not doing that well. Um, uh, and I, I assume... Uh, the vaccines available and, and the problem is just people thinking uh, COVID is in the rear view mirror. Um, I guess, do, do you have any, any thoughts on how we could uh, get people's attention? Sure. Thank you. You know, I, I, I there's a lot of fatigue out there around uh, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the continuation of COVID-19 being such a disruptor um, in all of our communications, you know, we, we make the, the impacts of COVID um, as, as clear as we possibly can. Um, at 18%, you know, that we would really like to see a much higher vaccination rate um, than that. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, the overall rate across the country is is so much lower. So um, I'm I'm really grateful for our community and their their willingness to um, to be vaccinated. I think another piece of um, of COVID nineteen that uh, where vaccination makes a really uh, strong case is. Um, is around uh, long COVID, which is still uh, not 
uh, very well understood. Um, there have been numerous uh, studies that have shown that people who are up to date with vaccination have lower rates of long COVID as well as lower rates of severe illness. So uh, we uh, we continue to to try to increase confidence in vaccines and the the um, importance of getting those boosters um, and and seeking best practices and best resources. And, and honestly, we, we are doing uh, well in terms of having the tools um, and sharing the tools and we'll continue to, uh, to ensure that we're, we're doing the, the where, where, where the health department, um, uh, where I believe that we, we do a, a really good job is um, we focus in on um, our, our communities at, at highest need and highest risk. And so um, our immunizations program and, and our, our uh, home visiting uh, nurses and others are, are uh, not just giving the vaccines, they're actively conducting outreach to long-term care facilities and to skilled nursing facilities. And um, not, not, not just sharing the information, but um, bringing, bringing the opportunities and the access to them through connecting um, uh, pharmacies with the long-term care facilities, getting more opportunities in case uh, people, you know, weren't interested or able the first time around. So, uh, we are continuing to uh, to conduct outreach and to just share the general information. We 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 still have um, vaccines, uh, vaccine um, marketing um, and, and advertising that we're uh, we continue to do, and we're refreshing those regularly. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to, to do that and, uh, follow best practices as, as we learn of more. Uh, how does the uh, COVID vaccination rate compare to the flu, um, um, vaccination rate? That's a good question. Um, you know, we look at the COVID vaccination rate in, in, in different ways, right? We, we um, can measure the, the initial primary series of, of vaccination, which is, which is much higher than the 18%, of course. It's, it's closer to 80%, um, the flu vaccination rate. Um, this this data, I, I usually get the, the numbers directly from the immunization uh, site and um, wasn't able to get into it this morning. So as of um, about a month ago, we're uh, second in the state for overall population at about 27 and a half percent and over 50 percent for ages 65 and over for influenza. And if we were to look at the, the, the data again for um, for COVID-19, you know, um, overall sort of primary vaccination is, is much higher. And then we had the boosters, um, varying, uh, varying numbers of boosters based on uh, different factors. And then this most recent um, booster with the monovalent sort of targeted um, uh, strain, um, is, is just not getting the traction that um, our initial vaccines do. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, there, there is a uh, widespread, um, widespread um, illness, you know, a lot of people are getting COVID-19 and, and, and it can be confusing to know when, when you should get your vaccine. If you've had a, an infection, um, we have all of those guidelines in place. Um, I do think that we're in a, a, a place of exhaustion and overwhelm, but, um, we will, we will continue to, um, to practice vaccine confidence, um, and continue vaccine administration, you know, uptake, um, to the best of our ability. Uh, thank you for that information and, and for you and your team's effort to keep people uh, safe during this uh, cold weather. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. 
any other questions from my fellow commissioners or county administrator? Thank you much. Okay, moving on to agenda item 4.2, uh, recognition of Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Yesterday, as you all know, was a holiday celebrating the contrib contributions of Reverend uh, Dr. Martin Luther King to our nation. But unfortunately, the icy weather interfered with many of our usual ways of celebrating Martin Luther King. The annual peace march hosted by Oregon State University and, and ongoing community volunteerism on uh, Martin Luther King Day, much of which takes place outdoors. The life's work of Reverend King and his colleagues has been uh, greatly on my mind over the last few weeks as our election season revs up into full gear. His focus on equal rights before the law and in practice is in, as important as ever, given that the U.S. lacks a constitutional clause guaranteeing every citizen over 18 the right to vote in presidential and congressional elections, as some other countries have. Our laws are a real patchwork interpreted by the courts, so we must continue to be vigilant to protect voting rights for everyone. King's emphasis on economic rights also reverberates today. A lot of our partisan wrangling has roots in economic inequality alongside cultural differences, but reshoring manufacturing to the U.S. and increasing union power helps. On the other hand, distribution of wealth and income in our country remains extremely high. It's the highest of any of the G7 nations, for instance. Our COVID-era programs for universal basic income and expanded child tax credits demonstrated that we have the tools to change this equation. So we still have a lot of work to do to achieve the vision that Martin Luther King laid out in the 1960s before he was so unfortunately assassinated. Uh, we have a lot of work to do to um, foster the creation of beloved community, as he would say. Oregon State University is hosting multiple commemorative events, including lectures and other um, conversations. And uh, you can find information for that at their um, Office of Institutional Diversity. Um, and uh, I would encourage people to check them out. Uh, there are some uh, interesting uh, folks coming to speak uh, and those uh, presentations will be both virtual and uh, in person. So there's opportunity for many people to share in the further commemorations of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's um, life and uh, mission. So thank you. Uh, next up, is James Morales with the discussion of proposed revisions to Benton County Code uh, chapters uh, four, five, and six having to do with uh, elections. Um, James, welcome. Good morning, commissioners. You might want to speak up a little bit where it's a little hard to hear you. Oh, okay. Good morning, commissioners. <laughs> Hope that's loud enough. Um, I must have my mic turned down. I need to figure out how to get that turned back up. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, I'll just speak loudly. Okay, so um, before you today, you have, we have uh, chapters four, five, and six to the Benton County Code, which guide um, the filing of candidates for county offices, as well as uh, that's chapter four. And chapter five is going to be our our measures. And chapter six is going to be voters pamphlet related uh, guidance. So primarily what we sought to do here is to clarify, make a lot of clarifications within the code, because whenever we'd refer to it, sometimes we'd find ourselves uh, confused as to uh, which elections the codes were referring to, uh, starting off with referring to special elections when, in fact, uh, the code was referring to much more than just special elections. So we made some clarifications in the election section, starting out in Chapter 4, to which uh, the section is affecting. Uh, we removed uh, any uh, reference to precinct committee persons because those are not county offices and that was not what the code was intended to address. Uh, there are uh, much of these election processes are addressed through the Oregon revised statute and there's plenty of guidance there. But when we have things like ranked choice voting, which is specific to uh, Benton County, we want to address that and we also want to address uh, the 
election of county offices and the nominating process is affected by that. So that's what we did. And in fact, uh, Commissioner Weiss also provided additional feedback in the email that I just was able to go over this morning. And those are all, I thought, really good suggestions to add additional clarity to those uh, sections of statute or to this uh, Benton County Code that we are re revising. So uh, thank you for that, Commissioner Weiss. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, another part of what we were cleaning up was the filing date. We had a, we had brought forward some changes previously and we missed a date, which we, they should have gone to the 70th day and our 71st day and it went to, and we had it at the 60th. So we have, we caught that error and we're correcting that. That actually affects the commissioner's filings. And it lines it up with the ORS as well. We've done that. Uh, then in chapter chapter five, we were just making it clear that explanatory statements are they're actually a voter's pamphlet filing and they're not there's not going to be a judicial review, but um, Benton County has a process for explanatory review that is done by the county clerk um, where um, we, I, I can only recall doing that once and Vance was a key part of that process in helping um, helping us get through that particular review. I think it was back when the Riverfront Park was done way back. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. And in uh, we also added some clarity that uh, if ranked choice voting is not utilized in the election for county commissioners or county positions, that uh, plurality, uh, the, the candidate receiving the most votes is also elected. It's not just going to be the ranked choice process. And I, I wanted to just mainly ask if you had any questions about the changes or did you, you saw any that were of concern or that I can address in particular? So I have a question. Um, so separate from the email that I sent with the, my suggested edits, um, on page 22 of the packet, which is chapter five, page four of that, um, it's, let's see, section 5.375, cost and election date for advisory measures. Um, it states or mentions that advisory measures will be limited to elections, um, which are not even year primary and general general elections. Is that new or has that been our current practice? So that was something, so as, as you know, advisory measures are specific only to Benton County. No one else in the state has any guidance or there's not anything in statute of regarding advisory measures. Plus uh, we, we uh, adopted ranked choice voting advisory measures as an option, which is also unique to Benton County. My concern became that if we did get one on the primary general back, uh, ballot was ballot space and uh, being able to fit a ranked choice voting measure, advisory measure on that space because we're giving options and, and, they, and we're talking about um, quite a bit of ballot space needed to convey that to the electorate. So the idea that I had to save uh, some space there was to limit the election or to make sure that there's plenty of space on the ballot, I should say, um, was to limit the elections in which it can be submitted to the electors to any election other than the primary or general election for an advisory measure. Thank you. So um, I guess to play devil's advocate, what, I mean, are we, what happens if there's too much stuff for a ballot? Do we go to a second page? Can you make the ballots longer? I mean, I, I just don't know how that works. Yes, we can make our ballot longer up to 17 inches is the limitation of our particular system. Um, and after that, that is when you do go to a second page 
there's particular challenges that occur uh, when a ballot has more than one page, when you're trying to audit your election and uh, make sure that everything balances. So my goal is to try and avoid pushing a second to a second page ballot if, it, if at all possible. And because I've, I've had to do it once before in, in the general election of 2000, and it was just a real challenge to try and um, show that this is how many ballots got returned from this many electors, and this was the turnout versus this is the number of votes that were cast. When you have voters that return, say, only page two of the ballot or only page one of the ballot, it's it makes it uh, a real complicated process. Uh, I'm, we may be better equipped now to figure it all out than we were then, but it came as a little bit of shock, uh, I think, in that first go around. Thank you. So I guess my question for the other commissioners is, I mean, so all that makes complete sense. Um, so I just want to get your two thoughts on, I mean, technically this would be limiting what can be put on a ballot. It's, it's technically limiting an election um, for good reason, it sounds like, but I just want to make sure that we are okay doing that or not. Commissioner Malone? Yeah, I, I'm fine with the uh, change. Uh, uh, James, have we had a, uh, have we used the advisory uh, option uh, to this uh, date? To date, we have not used the ranked choice voting advisory measure option. There have been advisory measures that are just yes or no. Um, but uh, not the ranked choice voting. Another limitation that's on the ranked choice voting advisory measure is that it be a district fully contained within the boundaries of Benton County since our neighbor uh, counties would not be able to process ranked choice ballots. Okay, uh, I, I'm fine with the... Uh, change here and, and if it um, becomes a real problem instead of a theoretical problem, we can, we can address that uh, uh, at a later date. But uh, I think uh, just for practicality, this change, um, I, I, I'm fine with the change. From my perspective, um, I fully understand the audit issues and, and the complications that it introduces. Um, when you have a multi-page ballot, um, if and when the state um, shifts its, some of the state offices to rank choice voting, um, we probably will have multi-page ballots. Uh, and at that point, I would think that we might reconsider this clause uh, and the technology hopefully will be better as well. Uh, so I'm fine with this for now, but I think that it would be a good idea to flag it um, to see if there's demand um, in future and also uh, to be in accord with the latest capacity in terms of our technology for auditing ballots. And I would maybe, I would request also that we reach out to our partners at the cities um, and let them know about this change just so that there's no surprises for them down the road. Sure, I can do that. My, my other question is, um, uh, given that the Nancy's comments, Commissioner Wise's comments uh, came in the form of um, an electronic mail message and they have not been seen or published, um, uh, do we want to proceed with a first reading today uh, and the public hearing? Um, or should, you know, how do we do that? Do we hold the public hearing and then continue it um, so that everyone can see those changes? Um, in in black and white before uh, we conduct a first reading. I guess that's partly a question for my fellow commissioners, but also for Vance as our county council. So I guess the first thing I, I want to add is that Commissioner Wise's email this morning, Erica, that should be placed in the record of the public meeting. Um, it is entirely obviously up to the three commissioners I would posit that Commissioner Wise's edits 
are not much different than what we typically see during the public hearing um, that might be made verbally. So um, looking at what she submitted this morning doesn't seem to change the tenor much of what was proposed. I think uh, James's um, initial edits to chapters four, five, and six um, are a bit meatier, no offense, Commissioner Wise, than uh, Commissioner Wise's edits. And those have been published and those have been available to the public. So with that information, you know, the, the three of you can decide what to do with the uh, with the hearing. I would one other point. There is a time frame within which um, elections and James is hoping to have this completed so that it is effective uh, for the next election cycle. Thank you for that um, and for the reminder of the timeliness of the changes. Um, might I suggest that um, we um, ha have staff uh, take the, the content of Commissioner Wise's edits and uh, put them into just a slide or two so that they can actually be shared um, on screen uh, during the public hearing uh, component of our meeting, just for full transparency. I recognize that they're not, um, they don't change substance, that they're more about form and clarity, but um, I'm just interested in transparency. And I, I would agree with that, Commissioner Ogero. I'm fine um, putting off the public hearing if we have time. Uh, James, do you know off the top of your head what that timeline is or if postponing would still work for that? Yes, I believe uh, we'd still be fine if we go to next week for the public hearing um, because the and, and the first reading because the second reading would be uh, February 6th, if I understand. Is that correct, Vance? And that timeline would still work if we brought the full text of uh, your changes as well as what I've brought forth uh, forward at next week's public hearing. Is that correct, Vance? It, it, yes, um, and, and if this is the direction the board wishes to go, um, I would recommend that we do open the public hearing today and then immediately continue it to next week because we've already published the, the the notices for today's hearing. It sounds like a plan. Okay. Well, thank you, James. Uh, I do have one last question. Um, I, so in those... In, I think there were five different headings of changes that I submitted that were, they weren't meant to be substantial as Vance said, but just for clarity and grammar and all that. Um, were there any of those uh, changes that either commissioner didn't like? I mean, okay, great. Looks like you have support from all of us. They... No. Okay, thank you. Anything else on this topic? Well, uh, just uh, uh, thank you to James and his uh, crew to um, uh, clean up uh, kind of our, our code slash bylaws so that uh, what we do and what we say we're going to do uh, uh, line up and, and uh, getting things coordinated with ORS and, and just uh, I I assume this hasn't hasn't been uh, changed in a while and and uh, it's every once in a while I have to do a little housekeeping so uh, I, I appreciate the 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 effort in getting rid of some wonky slash in inaccurate language. Thank you, commissioners. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the next item of business. Um, that is item um, 5.1, approval of the November 28, 2023 Tuesday board meeting minutes um, on the consent calendar. And I will note that although those minutes uh, still say draft, um, that is not the case. They are the final minutes as presented by our recorder. Do we have a, a motion to approve the consent calendar or are there any changes to those minutes? I would move to approve it with two changes. Um, <clears throat> on page 36, um, at the top of the page, let's see, sorry, I've got, it's hard with ones. 
page 36. Um, so the second sentence, it says, Wise wanted to ask RS, is in Republic Services, if there's evidence that the high volume discount is effective or if it causes more people to throw recycling into the garbage. And I think that's actually backwards. I think what I was saying was I wanted to ask Republic Services if there was any evidence that doing away with the high volume discount is effective or if it causes people to throw garbage into the recycling. And if that sounds familiar to both commissioners, then I would ask that that's one change that we make. And then uh, the other change was, uh, there's about halfway down the page, um, it said, Wise directed Nichols to inform RS that she could not approve the increase without speaking to a representative. I mean, one commissioner, I don't technically direct staff. So I would just request that we um, change that to um, request, like, wise, um, let's see. I actually took time to write this down, and now I can't find it. Um, <laughs> wise stated that she could not increase, or wise stated that she could not approve the increase without speaking to our public services first. So Wise um, in, informed Nichols that she could not approve the increase without first speaking to a representative of our public services. Perfect. Or hearing from a representative of public services because we were asking them to come back to the board. Erica, did you capture that? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, um, Commissioner Malone, any edits or changes? Or are you okay with those um, changes to the minutes? Uh, I'm fine with the changes, and I, I don't have anything else to, uh, to add. Is that a second? So, I will second the consent calendar with the uh, changes that uh, Commissioner Wise just made. Thank you. Um, all in favor, please syndicate with an aye. 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 Thank you very much. Um, we will now move into, do it, first of all, does anyone need a break before we move on? Okay, then we will move into new business. Um, is um, as long as we have the appropriate staff with us. Um, I, our first next item of business is item 7.1, and I do not see our uh, Natural Areas Parks and Events Director with us online yet. So uh, with um, your permission, I'd like to move to item 7.2 while we um, make sure that Tommy's able to join us. And um, ask uh, Gary Stockhoff to please um, present item 7.2. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, item 7.2 concerns the naming of the new collector street that we're building as part of the courthouse DA EOC project. Uh, we are uh, being asked to follow a procedure by the city. And part of that is to submit uh, three prioritized names to them. Uh, I want to thank Corey and John V and the staff over there who pulled all the information together and did the polling and monitored it. Um, it, it made this old engineer's brain uh, handle this a lot easier. So I appreciate their help in doing that. Um, as you can see from the information, after the poll, the, the top three names were Chompinafu uh, and then followed closely by um, Carson Drive and Moore Drive. Now, just so you know, Drive is the nomenclature that we are being asked, I think, follow based on the direction of this road and where it takes off of Highway 20. Eventually, this road will kind of angle back to the north and east, and I believe tie into that ring road around uh, HP, and then eventually come out there at... Um, at Circle, where the light is at, so it'll it's part of Corvallis's transportation system plan. 
So the the what we're asking today is for uh, to confirm how you want to rank the names, and then we will uh, submit the application to the city for their review and approval. And it's reviewed by the fire marshal. I think our surveyor looks at it just to make sure it's not duplicative or confusing or something like that. But I believe the three names that we have fit into those um, requirements and any of them could be considered to be the name for the new road. And with that, I will take questions or guidance. Okay, I look to my fellow commissioners for um, your um, feedback on the three top polling okay. names, Shapinapu, honoring the Kalapuya uh, band's um, ancestral homelands here, Carson, uh, for Letitia Carson, and more, I don't recall. Um, um, I, I could give a, a little description of that one if you'd like. It's thank Harriet you. Moore, yeah. Harriet Moore, thank you. Uh, Corey, that would be great. Um, so Harriet Moore served in the U.S. Army Medical Corps, uh, pursued education and contributed to Oregon State College Library and Archives. Um, and she was just really committed to historical accuracy and dedicated to helping students. Thank you. Commissioners, preferences? I guess um, I have a question. So the poll that went out, that was um, for Benton County community members? That is my understanding, yes. Okay. Corey, Corey, or Jim, Corey can probably clarify that. I'm sorry, what was the question again? Um, the polling that was done, was that for Benton County community members? It was, yeah. We, we posted that on a variety of channels, including Nextdoor and our social media channels and shared it with local media. And so that was um, our community members, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there was just um, very little information in the packet for me to dig into and try to figure this all out, so... Um, I guess my, um, one of them, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, Chapanafu. Is that? Chapanafu. The M Chipanifu. is, um, silent as I understand it. Okay. Cause we, so we already have a park in Corvallis that has a similar name, but different spelling. So I just wonder if that would be confusing for people. Um, but that's not necessarily a deal breaker for me. Just wanted to put that out there. I'm open to hear the other commissioner's um, thoughts as well. Yeah, I've got a, a question, Gary. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the, to start, uh, any of these names will uh, be drive um, and that, that could change uh, when it becomes a through street. Uh, but the the name that we uh, the first name would would remain the same. It would just turn to uh, to Pinafu Street or uh, whatever the Corvallis Convention is. Yeah, I mean, I think it right now it looks like to be Drive, um, and it would be whatever the preferred name is Drive. From Highway 20 up to Circle Drive, up to Circle Boulevard. That that's my understanding of how Corvallis would work. It uh, originally Corvallis asked us to make it Walnut, which is the road that's the other on the other side of Circle where the signal is at. And then they came back and said, No, no, we don't want Walnut. So you guys come up with a name. So that's that's where we're at now. I will say, commissioners, according to our votes, it was a very close vote tally between the top two, Chompinifu and, and Carson. I think there's only four vote difference. Okay, I don't um, have a, a terribly strong preference. I like the acknowledgement of the Kalapuya band. Um, um, my only concern is that a given pronunciation um, questions and the ambiguity um, if we had emergencies along that drive and there uh, with uh, on the community safety and justice campus it might be a little more challenging initially um, but I think that that could be overcome 
Um, uh, all of these um, names uh, have great emotional resonance for um, elements of our community and want to acknowledge that. Um, so I would be happy with either Shapinifu or uh, Carson Drive. Thank you, Commissioner Ozier. I think the point you make about pronunciation is valid. Um, although, like you said, um, as time goes on, I think people... So I'm reminded of um, a former governor of California, a Terminator. What was his name? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, okay, so people can learn and pronounce Schwarzenegger. I think they can have. I think they can figure this out. Point well taken. And, and that to me sounds like an endorsement of Shapinifu. It's fine with me. So, I let's see. Um, I am happy to make a motion. Um, I move to approve submitting Chapinifu Drive, Carson Drive, and Moore Drive as the preferred street names for the new Collector Street for the courthouse slash district attorney's office facility. Second. All in favor, please indicate with an aye. 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 Thank, Thank you, you commissioners. I will, I will keep you posted on how we do with our city process. Okay, kind of fun. Well, uh, Gary, any other uh, news to uh, report on the courthouse project? We're we're moving forward. Um, it, you know, great things are happening. Um, we actually, I will not on the courthouse itself, but on the EOC, uh, we sent out schematic drawings or the start of that on Friday. So we are moving ahead very quickly on the EOC and. The sheriff and his staff have been awesome to work with, and um, we we see it coming down the schedule as we hope it would be that it, they can just pick it up and and carry on with it as as they are underway with the courthouse and the DA. So, would the EOC uh, construction be simultaneous or? or... Yes. Yes. Okay. That that's the hope. Yeah. Well, and uh, another of our projects I noticed, I think last Wednesday, they were actually moving, uh, what do you call it, um, muck um, uh, on the um, crisis center site. As the crisis center, they're, they're taking out the, the bad and uh, they will replace it with the good and then they will then be able to start working on the foundation and start building it. So yes, it started last week of removing the contaminated soil. And, and as far as you know, this will be a continuous pro uh, process now that they're started, they'll uh, keep moving forward. That again, yes, that is the hope. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, um, Circle back to item 7.1. Um, uh, Director Douglas is not able to be with us today. She's having connectivity issues, evidently. Um, so, um, and her deputy, Jesse Ott, is also not with us at this time. Um, but uh, item 7.1 is a fairly straightforward agenda item. And um, with your permission, I would like to move ahead and um, approve it if we can. It's just a, a grant application approval. Uh, Rachel, do you know enough to speak to this? Uh, really broad base for EPA that we're looking at and working with some partners uh, uh, locally to, to look at this. It's very early on the stage, so we are um, looking forward to it. But unfortunately, I don't have any of the documentations in front of me, but I have been briefed by Tommy uh, to move forward. And of course, I think Rick Craker was also part of a little of those conversations, not to put Rick on the spot. Um, but uh, it never uh, hurts us to look for federal funding. This will take time, probably about a year and a half. Um, but, you know, anytime we have opportunities to go for federal funding and we can match it, we try to look at it to broaden the scope and mission of need. Okay, this particular uh, agenda item is for an Oregon Parks and Recreation Local Government Grant. 
So yeah, um, it is a local one. Um, and I, my, my understanding was that we looked at it previously um, and this is a second um, round of, of uh, proposals and they've upped the limit of what we can apply for. So um, uh, uh, the application would be to improving the restroom facilities at McBee. Um, and I think that that uh, is something that's a high priority for all of us so that we can make sure that that campground is back um, it, and available for uh, all of those that have become accustomed to um, using it. So um, are there, I don't know whether my fellow commissioners have questions. I know that this came up, has come up with us um, in our discussions with both Tommy Douglas and Jesse Ott um, at uh, previous work sessions. Yeah, I'm uh, generally familiar with this uh, grant and, and I uh, appreciate the suggestion to um, um, move forward. I, I don't see any uh, um, uh, downside to uh, uh, approving this. Would you be willing to make a motion? I would love to. I move to approve the Natural Areas, Parks, and Events Department to re request to apply for the 2024 Oregon Parks and Recreation Local Government Grant. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please indicate with an aye. 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 Okay. Well, with that, we have come to the end of our regular business. We do have some other um, discussion topics. We wanted to uh, ask the sheriff a little bit more about um, the storm forecast for today and likelihood of events tomorrow and how to best stay in touch and on top of what's going on. Um, so, Sheriff, if you're available. I am. Can you hear me all right? Uh, uh, Brian Lee just sent out uh, an updated email. They had a sit rep uh, meeting this morning situation. Uh, anyway, uh, it looks like this afternoon we're expecting between uh, the hours of 1300 and 1500, uh, at least possibly up to a quarter of an inch of additional freezing rain into this evening with a possible accumulation up to about half an inch. Um, I'll be in contact again this evening with Tracy Martineau and, and Rachel and, uh, we, we will, of course, make a, an educated decision. I'll, I'll talk to the on-duty supervisors for both Benton County and Corvallis Police Department, as well as reaching out to Public Works and, and coordinating with uh, Brian. Earlier, uh, April had mentioned her coordination with Brian. Brian's been off the charts the last few days. He's been great. He's, he's been coordinating a lot of uh, different, <laughs> different angles, both with the state and locally. Um, he, he sent out a handful of uh, messages, both over the text and email, um, he, he's just been, he's been on it and I just can't sing his praises enough. Um, the sheriff on the east side of the state reached out and wanted to make sure we were okay over here because they, you know, we just don't get these kind of storms on the east side. We get a lot of snow, but nothing like this. And this is wild. So I would encourage everybody if they don't have to, to stay home, don't, don't venture out. It's, it's not worth it. Um, the emergency room, as you saw, uh, the emergency rooms tied up with falls and, and injuries related to that. And so, um, just, just try and stay inside and just, uh, let's, let's get, let the warm weather hit us this evening into tomorrow. Uh, the jail made a, a late run yesterday to Norcor and brought back several people because the gorge is supposed to stay kind of nasty throughout the week and cold. And we aren't certain we're going to get back up there. So, um, with that, I'll answer any questions that you might have for me or if, if April's still here or, or, um, um, Gary. Commissioner Malone. Yeah, uh, my specific uh, concern is we have a, a scheduled meeting at 8.30 tomorrow morning. And uh, just personally, I, I've got some um, challenging uh, roads. Uh, Highway 223 is, uh, there's a reason it has three numbers and it's a secondary state highway, uh, which means uh, it's towards the middle or bottom of the list uh, as far as the state uh, uh, working on it to uh, clean it up. But uh, well, we could certainly hold that meeting remotely as we have this one. 
I, w- I would I would encourage that if it's a possibility. Uh, and talking with Rich at Public Works, he's only got so many resources, and they've been busy clearing roads and trees and whatnot. So as far as uh, getting Sanders out, it's it's been pretty hit and miss for him because his staff stretched pretty thin as well. Yeah, Highway 99 only got gravel this morning. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I, I think my my preference would be to just go ahead and say that we're going to do it virtual. Um, just it's always better to be safe than sorry. And it's mm-hmm. pretty convenient and easy for us to go virtual. So. Agreed. Uh, Chair, if I just have a question, it's Rachel. O- electrical outages are better now. Do we have an, I wasn't clear on Brian's uh, report. The, the last I heard, we were up to about 1,200 in, throughout the county, and that was a day ago. So I have to believe they've done some uh, uh, work on addressing that issue. I know that South Corvallis and some of the residents there had lost power for a little bit. Uh, it included downtown Corvallis, the, the jail and the sheriff's office, LEC, lost power. Our backup generators were being utilized then. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those deals. Brian didn't update it, so I have to believe it's not no, no longer an issue. Uh, had he had it been an issue, I know Brian would have certainly addressed it in his most recent email. Great. We, we lost power um, Saturday, just just about dark, um, and and then uh, I think the power came came back on uh, about two o'clock uh, Sunday morning. And but uh, the other thing with the freezing rain um, may have some more. Uh, tree limbs uh, falling, and um, so uh, late tonight. Uh, well, I guess uh, even this afternoon, evening, uh, there may be some more uh, electrical out- outages. And I would, I would add for Rachel's purposes as well, uh, having her not having been here previously for this event. Uh, once all this melts, we'll start seeing some some flooding. And so I've already had that started that conversation with under Sheriff Rogers as, as it relates to, you know, the next portion of this event. And I don't want to overwhelm Brian. So I'll, I'll hit uh, I'll hit him up probably tomorrow and we'll start discussing what it's what, if anything, the forecast looks for the, you know, the Mary's River, the Willamette and all the surrounding just just to make sure we're prepped for that. Thank you. You know, the Willamette was already up in the parking lot at um, the boat ramp uh, down right. here in South Corvallis. So um, it's going to be interesting. And, and I would add too, commissioners, um, Brian did a good job of communicating with NAEP and Jesse Ott and, and had this event gone on and, and we needed additional space. Um, I know that the NAEP was ready and willing to uh, accommodate that as well. So I just want to make sure that they get a little bit extra there. I know April worked her tail off and, and her folks. And so it, it, it's great communication and good stuff. We'll have an after action review next week with Brian just to see what we can do better next time because there's always going to be a next time and that's how you get better. So, Thank you. Are there any other questions for Gary or for um, Jeff at this time? No questions. I just want to verify that we are uh, agreed on all, an all virtual meeting for tomorrow morning. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we're all agreed, and um, I, obviously, uh, power outages are the are the big caveat. Uh, um, hopefully, we um, we and staff will um, have access. So, I would recommend that um, any updates to our meeting process tomorrow, or if there needs to be a cancellation, that it come to us all by text, um, and. Make sure your cell phones are charged so that I, you can receive said text um, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Okay, at this time, this, this is, I'm sorry. This is Amanda speaking. Um, I have the keys for changing the um, the online the website. So if anybody has any updates, please make sure that they get to me so that I can get them onto the onto the website. So myself, John v, and Corey have access at this point. Other uh, folks are still in training. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Well, and I, I just wanted to thank the sheriff and his crew and, and April and and. Um, Brian Lee for uh, helping uh, get us through this uh, 
Rachel, this is unusual to uh, usually our, our snow is uh, wet and sloppy, uh, kind of 50 cent piece uh, size flakes that uh, can uh, knock you over a little bit. So to uh, just have ice um, and um, it's hard to walk. I mean, it, um, so anyway, uh, uh, thank everybody who's involved in uh, helping get us through this uh, kind of challenging weather. Well, I'd like to just add, as someone who uh, came from an emergency management background a little bit in the state of New York, you have a really strong team here, commissioners. Uh, they're very communicative. You have a strong emergency manager, a strong sheriff, um, and uh, they were the communication over the weekend was fluid. There was absolutely a, a level of competence and leadership within the York County government and your partners that I witnessed, um, having only been here a short three months, uh, that you should be very, uh, the, the people of Benton County should feel like they're in very good hands. Yeah, I agree with that. I was very impressed um, to see all of the emails back and forth, everyone coordinating, all the plans coming together. Um, it makes me feel really good about being a commissioner of this county. Well, and, and uh, along those lines, if you're still with us, Corey, um, maybe get out some information after the e event and, and kind of capture some of the comments that we, we've just made to uh, let people know uh, what the county was up to um, during this e event and, and um, thank people that... Uh, um, put in a lot of time over what, what was supposed to be a long, um, quiet weekend. Absolutely. We can, we can work on that. Great. Thanks. It's going to be very exciting when we get a new EOC, Emergency Operations Center, which is even going to, you know, want to remind you that our small emergency management staff and sheriff's office are in very small quarters. And even with that, how effectively they're able to, um, execute. Thank you all. Okay. Um, is there any other other business? We, we come back at 11 for the public hearing. I, at this point, we will stand in recess until 11 a.m. Uh, for the public hearing regarding the first reading of Ordinance 2024-0322, proposing revisions to Benton County Code Chapters 4, 5, and 6. See you all at 11. We must be doing something right. Uh, Vance looks happy, smiling, nodding his head. So, <laughs> Thank you. See you soon. We will reconvene our uh, board meeting um, for January 16th at this time with um, our public hearing. Uh, first reading of Ordinance 2024-0322, proposing revisions to Benton County Code for Chapters 4, 5, and 6 uh, with uh, James Morales. Sorry about that. Is my is my mic working better this time? It is. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, we went over this earlier, but I believe uh, we were going to add to the record the email from Commissioner Wise. We can do that. Um, should I go over what was sent? Uh, if you would just um, briefly um, go over the intent of this public hearing, uh, because we do have members of the community on uh, the call, um, and I'm not sure they were here with us this morning. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. And uh, then we can invite, um, uh, then we can take a look at those edits suggested by Commissioner Wise, uh, and uh, we can... I either invite uh, members of the public to testify at this time, or we can just continue the hearing uh, till uh, th our next scheduled date. Okay, so um, the changes to chapter four, uh, 
clarify the elections that are, are impacted by the Benton County Code, which would be the uh, primary general and any special elections called by the county commission. Uh, remove Removing some of the confusing titles as well as the unrelated uh, precinct committee person section, which is not a county office. Um, correcting um, an erroneous filing date with, that affected the commissioners, which was uh, listed as 61st day and it should have been the 70th to align it with the statute and the election process itself. And uh, being clear that uh, whether we use ranked choice voting or um, the traditional plurality voting, that uh, the elected can how the who the elected candidate will be in each case. Um, chapter five, we clarified that explanatory statements are not a ju there's not a judicial view review subject to that. That's an actual voters pamphlet filing with a separate review process. Um, let's see, then in chapter six, we added uh, language to clarify uh, advisory measure, the advisory measure ballot title and explanatory process, which also has a review process within that uh, part. Let's see. Well, actually, that was still in Chapter 5. Sorry about that. Um, so that's in Chapter 5. And Chapter 6, um, we added some flexibility to the manners in which the voters' pamphlet can be distributed, um, allowing for electronic or budgetary con constraints, not making it a requirement. Uh, voters' pamphlets are not required in statute, typically. But Benton County, of course, uh, our our philosophy is that if we can do it, we will do it. And so that's how we, we want our voters to be educated. So that is the intent. We just uh, want to make sure that if we're in a situation where it makes more sense to distribute our pamphlets differently or uh, in some other fashion, that we have the flexibility in our code to allow us to do that. And uh, let's see, well, we also clarified uh, some of the space requirements, uh, just leaving it to word counts rather than square inches uh, for voters pamphlet space, um, photo requirements, so that was an antiquated, and uh, we, we're just allowing for the uh, electronic submission of those photos as well. And so that's, that's what was submitted to you. Uh, we we did also add uh, um, language and gender um, requirements to requirements and um, other um, ability to to, to uh, change the language if or add another language if needed um, to the materials that we provide. So that is in there as well. And uh, Commissioner Weiss uh, had provided additional clarification and uh, grammar uh, improvement language to be considered as well. And I think that's where we're at. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions for James at this time? Okay, hearing none, um, I would like to uh, invite public testimony. Is there anyone here that would like to testify on this ordinance? Uh, Mark Yeager. Yes, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Um, not having any background on the um, information that has been presented to the commissioners, I wonder if it might be helpful to explain um, to those that might review this as a recording later, since there doesn't seem to be any other public members on the call. Um, what process was used to 
develop these changes? Were there any um, outside um, either advisory committee or state elections uh, personnel? Was Is this just simply something that the county is doing on its own uh, without any um, participation or input from either members of the public or other um, election officials. So if, if there could be some background uh, presented as part of this process, I think that would be helpful in understanding what's driving the change now and what's driving these specific changes. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question, Mr. Yeager. Um, what was dri is driving the, what got me to identify the need was when I saw that the uh, filing date for the commissioner had been missed actually the last time we had done an update to the county code. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, we need to get that date corrected. And in doing so, it just so happened that we were working on the county website and we were learning more about uh, shortening up our language a bit, trying to be a little clearer. Um, and we had uh, in the past at times um, struggled to, I guess, understand some of our own county code. And so just uh, myself, uh, elections manager, Darla Rush and County Council Vance Crony went through these chapters guiding our election processes uh, in some areas to see if there was anywhere that we could add some clarity to the existing um, processes. I think the one place that uh, is not just adding clarity to what's already being guided elsewhere, is meaning in Oregon Revised Statute, was uh, in our advisory measure section, which is strictly a Benton County code uh, process. There is no um, Oregon revised statute guiding advisory measures. So in that one, uh, we and we discussed this earlier, but you may not have been present. Um, I had uh, sought the change where uh, we're clear that any, any uh, city or district that requested an advisory measure bear the cost for doing so and that the elections that an advisory measure could be submitted be limited to elections other than the primary and general election and the reason for that was um, trying to make sure that uh, we did not push to a two-page ballot and, and that process and the reasons for that or uh, the difficulty in auditing the election process when you get pushed to a two-page ballot and the way we have designed the uh, ranked choice voting advisory measure process it takes up a lot of space because you're 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 doing a measure with uh, up to five options what for voters to consider that uh, really takes up a lot of ballot space and, and uh, I, I just feared that that would push us to multi-page ballots and be confusing for the voters as well as um, difficult to audit that process in the end to determine the number of votes cast number of ballot or number of voters participating and uh, ballots returned. James, could you give us a hypothetical um, example of what an advisory measure would be? When we... Uh, Yes, sure, Commissioner Bougereau. <laughs> I mean, wise. <laughs> um, when we uh, first presented this idea, when I presented it, uh, the example given was the actual jail measure to um, util may potentially utilize that for um, the advisory ranked choice voting process, where maybe several options might be uh, presented to the electorate or just to gauge where the commissioner might gauge uh, what an interest in, say, the size of the jail, the cost of the jail, the um, those sorts of things, the services included in the measure, 
um, might might be. So that was kind of the example that was presented at that time. So if I could, um, so is my understanding correct that if let's say uh, Benton County or the city of Corvallis, city of Philomath, city of Monroe, city of Adair Village wanted to put out a question for their voters and say, you know, would you rather have option A, B, or C? And then people could vote on the option that they want or rank their options. Um, then we would get that information back and it wouldn't be um, setting any measures or anything, you know, official. It would just be giving us information that we could use. Is that correct? Correct. It's non-binding. Thank you. Thank you, James. Is there anyone else that would like to testify at this time? Are there any other questions for James? I'd like to just comment that uh, when it comes to um, county code, uh, this process of um, publishing the draft language, holding a public hearing, um, and um, having people participate as you have, Mark, um, in this process is part of that whole public process. And given that the edits that Commissioner Wise proposed um, to um, this language, um, we are planning to continue this public hearing so that we can indeed have more people be aware of the language and what we're doing and not have multiple versions of the uh, county code language um, in place as we change it. So um, yes, it was only county staff that participated in this particular change. We are a home rule county with a, our own charter um, and our code is, unless there's something that is prescribed by the state, uh, it, it is up to us and our voters to approve of uh, anything. Uh, so this public hearing is an, the opportunity to uh, provide input. Um, James, you don't have any specific advisory councils or bodies to the elections office, correct? That's correct. Uh, I, I thought I did identify that it was myself, uh, elections manager Darla Rush, and county council Vance Crony. We were the ones that reviewed it. We were strictly looking at cleanup um, and trying to correct that date in particular. And that's, and I think I went over what was. Yep. And this is not new. Uh, we have been cleaning up this language over the last couple of years, ever since we, uh, the voters of Benton County endorsed ranked choice voting for the commissioner's races. Um, we've made a series of changes um, and uh, most of them have been purely in order to use plain English um, and in order to um, bring us into the modern age, uh, as James mentioned, to uh, do things like uh, electronically submit a digital photograph, which was not possible when the code was first written. Uh, okay. Commissioner Malone. Yeah, uh, I'm not uh, sure James um, mentioned uh, it this time, but on the uh, a two-page ballot, uh, your explanation uh, earlier this morning, I think, uh, clarified for me that uh, there are real problems with two-page ballots in your, uh, I guess, in, in the audit process that um, uh, there's a possibility for people send, only sending one page back uh, uh, of the two-page ballot, and, and that uh, uh, creates some uh, real issues with the uh, with the audit uh, process. And, and, and I uh, appreciated that uh, clarification because it, uh, if you're just talking about it, well, one page, two page, uh, what's the difference? But uh, there there is a real difference. So appreciate that 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 information. Thank you. Um, Council Crony, at this point, uh, do we need to take a vote to extend this uh, hearing to um, our next meeting date or do we just, can I just state that? Um, it's, it's this is the chair's prerogative um, to um, 
continue this hearing, you'll need to continue it to a uh, time, date, and place certain, which presumably would be 11 a.m. Tuesday, January 23rd, um, both virtual and at the um, board's meeting room at 4500 Southwest Research Way. Okay. Okay, so at, at this time, I will... Uh, um, continue this public hearing to uh, January 23rd at 11 a.m., uh, both virtual and in uh, person at the Holmes Shipley meeting room. Um, and we will uh, have a full uh, draft of the changes uh, in the packet and um, continue at that time. And and I just, just to clarify, I believe this is a direction you're heading, um, Commissioner Ogero, you are not closing public testimony, which means the opportunity will be available next week for anyone to comment on the changes. Correct. We are not closing public testimony at this time. Thank you. I have a clarifying question. When it comes to uh, the information that we will see in the packet, um, I assume so the email that I sent with edits will be in there, or are we just looking at having one document with all the changes? My preference is one document with all the changes. Okay. We could we maybe have both? Like, could we get the same version um, that was in this packet and then also the new version with the edits that I submitted just so that it's easy to see them side by side? Your request is noted um, and we'll make sure that- I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we just want to make sure that everything is clearly labeled so <clears throat> people know what's what. Um, and um, there was another question. When does the packet come out? Uh, the packet, our goal is for the packets to come out the Wednesday before the meeting. Uh, so in this case, that is uh, very soon. Um, um, that is tomorrow. Uh, and I don't know, given uh, our... Um, ice storm and staffing, whether that's feasible, but we will do our best to get it out um, by close of business tomorrow. So with that, uh, we are uh, uh, close the public hearing and uh, we will um, now adjourn our meeting of the Board of Commissioners and uh, see you all uh, tomorrow in our next virtual meeting.